Oh, it does. You're right. Good morning. Foothills, a place of adventure, a place of love, a place of fun, a place where we encourage change, where we inspire positive change, and we love being part of positive change. So I invite you all here to worship. I see the smiles on your faces, so we are ready for a wonderful experience. I invite you to turn to your bulletin or up on the screen and join me in our invitation, please. Too often, we are too busy to see the, be to see the beauty of the places we inhabit. We fail. Why do we value so little the graces and forgiveness shown to us? And in the vein of joining the chorus, let's go to 420, I Come With Joy. And as we're able, let's stand together, be a chorus of singing, and join in worship today. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free. Jesus to recall in love laid down for me in love laid down for me I come with Christians far as all I bid the new community of love in Christ communion bread in Christ communion bread the spirit of the risen Christ unseen but Alive among us here. Please be seated. So, not seeing anyone shorter than me, <laughs> I'm thinking that you all get to be the, the children of children of God today for the children's time. I was going to ask them to use their imagination. So I want you to imagine that Tina brought everyone a wonderful surprise. <laughs> All got up and ran out the back door, and Tina just was standing there. What happened? She brought you all surprises, and you went running out the back door. But one of you, let's see, Charmaine said, oops, came back in and said, Tina, I want to give you my thank you. I want to thank you for that amazing surprise. If you remember, there's a story where Jesus is walking along the way, well, here are some children. Oh, well, here are some children. We were just talking about how sometimes Oh, you remembered. Thank you very much. Will you bring one over and sit on it? That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. You're being so kind. Well, I'm going to ask you 
to use your imagination. So Henry just gave you something to sit on, didn't he? Okay, you'll be right by me. Say he brought you a wonderful surprise, and he gave it to you, and you ran out the back door. You were so excited. How do you think Henry would feel? It might feel badly, because what did you forget to do? To say thank you. You'd like to hear that someone... To say thank you. You'd like to hear that someone say thank you when you do something nice. Did we all say thank you for giving us these? Um, yes. Yes. So I was just about to tell the story that Jesus was on his way somewhere, and he saw ten people who had been pushed out of the community, who had been pushed out of the community. No one wanted to be near them. And they, and they asked him if he would help them. And so he showed love and care, and there was healing for them. And they all ran off. And then one of them came back to say, you think they said, they said, thank you. And I think that's a real gift we can give each other in this world. Thank you. Yes, is that when someone's kind, when someone shows care for us, and we feel better afterwards, saying thank you changes everything, right? I'll bring in, including that lovely little green guy. Come on in. Can we put our feet in the middle? Can you do that with me, Henry? Or do you want me to hold your foot? I got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Will you join me in prayer? These amazing young people in this circle and the ways they are learning to show their thank yous in the world and for the kindness they bring and for the thoughtfulness they teach us. We thank you. Amen. And now, and amen. Thank you.
Good morning. Today, uh, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, <clears throat> ten men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us him. They raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go show yourself to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, <clears throat> when he saw he had been healed, returned and praised God. Saw he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. <clears throat> you know, Samaritans back then, this is not, this is not in, the, in the reading. You know, they were outcasts. <clears throat> Jesus replied, reading, you know, they were outcasts. <clears throat> Jesus replied, weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, get up and go. Your faith has healed you. I don't know what happened to the other nine. <laughs> has healed you. I don't know what happened to the other nine. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. The uh, scripture today is another one of those gospel lessons that some people have heard before. And, uh, and that is anytime something good happens to you, you need to say thank you. That's the children's version. Sometimes the stewardship committee puts it a little differently. They say when uh, your church offers a benefit to you, you should waste no time in turning in your pledge card. <laughs> That's the stewardship group. But team, the ministry teams that do the work, the property team, sometimes they listen to this scripture, they watch this story, and then they say, they pay attention to the word attendance. They say, ten were healed, only one is here. What happened to the nine? Where are the nine? What happened to the nine? Where are the nine? How could we get them in the room? I look at this parable differently than all of those places. I look at it and ask myself, why in the world did Jesus send those guys, and those guys, those ten who he was ready to heal, to the priests? Show yourselves to the priests, he said. Sent them off. Didn't exactly run away. They did what they were told. But why in the world, what they were told? But why in the world would he send them to the priests? And you know what? I, one of them flatly refused. One of them said, no way, not doing that. That's not, not on my, not doing that. That's not, not on my card. Not planning to check that box. So did he tell them, all right, buddy, get with the program. Either do follow the rules or lose your privilege. No, he did not. He did not condemn the one. In fact, he said, look, right here, this is what gratitude looks like. Please pray with me. Thank you for stirring in us, God, that impulse of gratitude and however we express it, thank you for finding experience. May we acknowledge that we are not alone in good deeds or in good fortune. Amen. The Samaritan was not like the other nine, was not. To go before a priest for this guy, and the priests about why Samaritans are bad and Judaism is great and why are you, why don't, why you're such a bad person? And he knew that. And he wasn't about to submit to that again. And then Jesus, in a moment of clarity, I think, Jesus having, I don't get it, I, I should have known. Because a trip to the temple can't be all that important. The health of the Samaritan is what matters. Not whether he pays his dues in a ritual sense. 
There is no magic in the holy water. There is no water. There is no fairy dust in the incense. There is no part of the ritual practices we undertake as church that allows us to merit healing. Healing may lead to healthy religion, but religion is not necessary. Healthy religion, but religion is not necessary to experience the healing. It's an add-on. It's not a prerequisite. It's, a, it's frosting, and it's not cake. Now, there are uh, some people, and you know them, and maybe you're going to be a church, well, I'm, I'm not really all that into religion, right? Yeah, it's very common. And so um, the, the answer we usually give is, that's okay. Jesus wasn't that into religion either. That's, that's the informed way to put it. And that's, and that's because Jesus was, in fact, not at all in favor of the kind of ritual practices. The, uh, he was sick and tired of the hypocrisy of people who knew the letter of the law and every jot and tittle of the law and didn't really understand its purpose and purpose. And that he completely rejected. And he got under their skin and, in fact, they went after him for it. They did not appreciate his criticism. But that does not mean that Jesus did not, in any sense, uh, reject religion altogether. He was not indifferent to things, uh, reject religion altogether. He was not indifferent to things that happened in temple or synagogue. His roots were sunk deep into the faith of his ancestors. And he was regular in his attendance at the local synagogue. Regular in his attendance at the local synagogue. Now let me just ask this sort of straw poll. How many people are in church today because their parents made them go? Uh, more than one, right? I see more than two, more than three. And I guess you ought to say, and I guess you ought to say, um, Honestly, get up, get dressed. We're leaving in 20 minutes. Well, it's Sunday, right? And that's my answer. It's Sunday. Yeah, well, you're part of this family, and this family goes to church. So get you. And you here, we're taking you with us. And so you go, right? Sometimes. Jesus heard the same line at his house. More to the point. I would say there's an awful lot of people who are not in church today because they were made to go as a kid. Very much like there are people who don't. Okay, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe they decided it was a healthy habit all on their own. <laughs> Jesus' parents made him go. Let's just face it. They started out by dragging him to the temple when he was less than one year old. He was just a, a newborn. I don't think he had much chance to object at that point. They dragged him, as we are told in the scriptures, when he was 12 years old. And uh, this was, went down to Jerusalem. He got lost in discussions at the temple. And he was so engaged in conversation about religious things that he lost track of time and missed the caravan heading back home. And uh, they had to, <laughs> did you have Jesus? No, no. Did, do, you, do you have Jesus? No. I guess, I guess he's back there. They went back and found him. And uh, he stayed. In fact, his answer was, didn't you know that I need to be here? I'm dealing with the things of my Father in heaven. That's enough from you, kid. We're going home. I'll show you who's your father. It would appear that Jesus attended regularly even after that episode. And Jesus approved of tithing as a discipline, it says in Scripture, seeing it as a means of bringing justice. A means of sure, seeing it as a means of bringing justice, a means of showing compassion. And finally, I would have to say he was all about prayer and even public prayer. He taught people how to pray, right? We have evidence that he encouraged it. He told them when, he told them how, he told them, and presumably he wanted them to do it often. So he had a habit of engaging in religious practices. And in spite of the fact that we like to say he's not into religion, he seemed to have had a habit that included 
the community of faith. He told those ten lepers, I can see your problem. You should go and show yourselves to the priests. I mean, maybe that was just the, the thing to do. Maybe that was just how it was done at that time. At the certain point, he never thought it through. When the Samaritan came back, Samaritan said, I'm having none of this. It's not going to work for me, Jesus. I've been hurt once too often by those guys, and it's just not right. The Samaritan was calling Jesus out. I thought you were Samaritan was calling Jesus out. I thought you were different, he said. And Jesus wised up. No questions asked after that point. He wised up. He got it. Healing should not depend on ritual observance. Healing should not depend on ritual observance. Healing can lead us to healthy religion. It doesn't issue from it. The Samaritan, you notice, did not just go home having been healed. I want some more. He wanted more. I've been sick. I've been tired. I've been isolated. I've been sick. I've been tired. I've been isolated for so long, and I'm not going to do that anymore. I, what can I do, Rabbi, to pay it forward? Give me another way to say thanks to God. And Jesus said, all right, I'll give you another way. Get off your knees. Said, all right, I'll give you another way. Get off your knees. Get up. Your faith has made you well. Go do something with it. How many of us have known somebody or are somebody getting clean in a 12-step getting clean in a 12-step program? You may have someone in your family who did this. Let me just say that these folks at the point at which they've been, let's say, six days or six months or six years into the program, the program, they are unstoppable. You cannot stop them. They are all about helping someone else who was in that situation that they were in. That is what they do for a living. That is how they make meaning in their lives. They give back. Are they in the temple? No. They're in the meeting turn them off they go they go every week some of them go every day and one measure of emotional health we are told is to go after a c e do you have a slide with a c e on it to check your ace status daily to make achievement for connection and for enjoyment these are the primary needs that we have as people not as religious people, as people. A need for achievement, a sense that we are achieving something, a need for connection, and a need for enjoyment. A need for enjoyment. And as self-serving as this might sound at this point, stewardship season can help us get there. It can. Because... It's healthy to give back when you've received something. It, it, giving here checks all the boxes. Achievement. It doesn't matter whether you want to be healing the planet or paving the parking lot. At some point, a gift is doing that. Whether you want to see food in the mouths of the hungry or faith in the lives of the discipline of financial support of a church meets a need to accomplish something. Week after week, we accomplish something with very little investment compared to the result. It meets our inner need for achievement. It's a church each week to be part of a larger family than your given family. People at this church often say, I feel like this church is my family. This is part of my family. And the chances might be that Church is not always friendly all the time. Not every church person is. Jesus, that someone at this church cares about you. The chances are good. And the chances are good that at, over time you may come to care about someone at this church. 
And I encourage you to nourish that connection. For months on end during the COVID isolation, even after we started meeting for worship, we cut short that fellowship time that where you go in there and have some food and drink some coffee and just talk. And boy, did we ever hear about that. <laughs> just talk. And boy, did we ever hear about that. <laughs> when are we going to get back to fellowship time? Well, it doesn't feel exactly safe to do it today. But when are we going to get back? It was uh, eventually, it was necessary for us to say, all right, we'll find a way. We'll put it outside for us to say, all right, we'll find a way. We'll put it outside. We'll, we'll uh, put the coffee. We'll, we'll tone it back. We'll pull it in. But we'll, but we'll do it. We'll do it because we need to enjoy one another's company. Eventually, mixed media company. Eventually, mixed media, that monthly meeting at the Dunlap home to, on a Saturday night to watch a movie and have some food. Eventually, that got started again. Eventually, the choir started to meet, and they got, they have a good time every once in a while. <laughs> and then just... And then just think about the enjoyment you get from the music of John and Jeff over here, or the choir this morning or any other morning. We, we get joy from being part of this place. Enjoyment. There's a movie I love, watch it more than my family can stand. In it, Denzel Washington confronts an aspiring football player on the first day of practice. The movie is Remember the Titans, right? Are you smiling? He says, are you smiling? Why are you smiling? Uh, you think it's fun. Uh, uh, yes, sir. It's fun then. Uh, uh, yeah, no. No, <laughs> no, sir. No, no, sir. Zero fun, sir. <laughs> it is granted. It is true that fun will not get you all the way. It is true that fun will not get you all the way there. But fun is a part of being a healthy person. It will not get you all the way there. If that's all you're looking for, you're, the team will never gel, right? But if you, I think they had a lot of fun in that movie playing football. I think they did. They had a lot of fun in that movie playing football. I think they did. And I think we do have fun. People who don't know any better tell you that the goal of the stewardship campaign is to make you give until it hurts. I have it make you give until it hurts. I have an entirely different way of looking at it. The stewardship campaign encourages you, you to give until it feels good, until you're having fun. And if stewardship, because if stewardship is an obligation, and if stewardship, because if stewardship is an obligation, if it's a chore, if it's a responsibility that you have to fulfill, honestly, believe me, that fire burns out. That fire burns out. People don't come to choir because they have to, even though because of these other reasons. And the same is true. If you have, uh, you are achieving something, and if you are connecting, and if you are enjoying that will light itself again and again that will make this engine reserves the institution but because it gives us a way to go after our aces and finish the week with a sense of contentment in fact giving is healing say no to religion if you please if you have to Say yes to healing. I want to leave you with Stephanie Duncan Smith's prayer for the overwhelmed and the overstimulated. Does that sound familiar? By now, she says, we all know marching orders, louder, faster, better, stronger, at the relentless altar of responsibility. Lead us once again, God, into quiet waters, and cultivate those waters within us. 
break us from the callous worn on our hands by over on our hands by over stimulation and teach us to want in the old way where we find deeper simpler streams in you and are filled sent out renewed renewed get up said jesus achieve connect enjoy your faith has made you well amen This time I'll encourage you to pick up the Purple Chalice Praise hymnal. We have a new song to share together today in worship entitled, You'll Find Love. So as you're able, let's please rise and join our voices in singing 106, You'll Find Love. Please rise and join our voices in singing 106, You'll Find Love. We'll have the slide with the words on it, please. For the failures, there's forgiveness. For the brokenness, eating for your souls. For the sickness, there's a cure. All who come here will find love. Be seated. I'm back. <laughs> I'm sure you're overjoyed. Um, I'm the chairperson of the finance committee, have been for a couple of years. But uh, now we're back on. Okay, I'm back. Um, I'm going to. <laughs> I should be out in the middle of the, without, I don't need a microphone. Uh, so we're kicking off the, the stewardship committee, of course, obviously that stewardship campaign, that means, you know, money. So first off, I'd like everybody, so first off, I'd like everybody to stand up, please. And I'd like you to look around, look at this place. Oh, no. 
it. We own it because of you. We paid off, paid off the mortgage this year. The bank doesn't own this place, have an interest in this place anymore. It's your generosity that made it possible. Without you, we would not be here. Now, if everybody be, would sit with the exception of Tina, Mary, and Bill, would you still please stay standing? Without them, would we be here? No. They are the ones who make this place run. And here, and we have to contribute money, but those people, they are us. They make us us. And we must say thank you to them. Without our financial support, we wouldn't have this campus. We wouldn't have those marvelous people who are here, who spend so much time and energy, much more so than they get compensated for. And we appreciate that. They could be, they could be, they could be at the beach having a great time. <laughs> but they come here every Sunday. They come here every time they're supposed to be here. And we need them and we need you. So we're asking you to help us with we're asking you to help us with keeping this crusade alive. You know, there are two crusades going on in the United States and in the world. Those crusades are based upon religion. One crusade I call the negative cr crusade. It's a crusade that wants to make women, put them back in the, in the kitchen, barefoot, and pregnant. That's where they belong on that cruise. People who want to be married to someone of the, same, of the same sex, make it illegal, throw them in jail. We're not there. We are the other crusade. We are the crusade of equality and fairness and justice. So we have to keep the crusade going. And we can only do that with your financial support because this church is about equality and justice and fairness, and, uh, but it takes money. So, here we go. Whatever you can contribute, fun, not difficult. I mean, if you ever wanna get mail, if you, don't, if you feel like I never get mail anymore, make a political contribution to somebody. Oh my goodness, I get a lot of mail. That's great, that's great. I feel, feel sorry for the mailman, but that's okay, or mail person, I should say. But we don't do that. We only ask you once or twice uh, in the mail. We're, you're gonna get a nice little letter. Uh, you, maybe you will read it, read it, maybe you won't. If you don't read it, that's okay. Uh, you, maybe you will read it, read it, maybe you won't. If you don't read it, that's okay. But the important thing is there's going to be a little card in there. And it's a pledge card. We're asking you to give whatever you possibly can. Monthly, weekly, annually, weekly, annually. And if you and you could even take out this little you know, go to lunch at at the office rather than going to the restaurant once a week. If you just buy lunch and take it to lunch. Take that money and put it in a, in a month. It all helps. The big, the little, and the in-between contributions help. And we're just asking you to do whatever you feel is comfortable because we are all in this together. Give what you can and give it with joy for our crusade. Thank you. for the prayer.
It's our habit to sing and rejoice of the gifts as they're brought forward. So please rise and join our voices in singing. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt, gives us love to tell, bread to share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, who can breathe again, past the world around us So now comes the part, you can, you can be seated now. Now comes the part where I'm supposed to do a prayer. I'm not very good at that. Now comes the part where I'm supposed to do a prayer. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> uh, but we are thankful for the contributions that are made today. We are thankful for all of you. We are thankful for what we do, what you do. Uh, we thank God that we're for what we do, what you do. Uh, we thank God that we're all here and that we have both mental and physical health and that we strive to have that. We are, pray we are thankful for that. And we are thankful for our theme, be the change. Pray to be the change about the change and let's be together at all times. Thank you very much, God. We thank you for everything you do for us and for us as a community, amen. Prayerful gratitude keeps us mindful of the giftedness of life. It turns us towards the gift of breath and sight and hearing. It directs through their caring and grace smooth the jagged edges of life. Gratitude turns life into a holy enterprise instead of expected privilege. Joy seeps into the cracks of grief, renews discouragement. And we discover a way in the midst of that gratitude to be the change in small and great ways. I am grateful for each of you that are online and are in this place. I am grateful for each of you that are online and are in this place and the ways you've graced Bill's and my life. Pause with me to think of people you know for whom you are grateful. People you know for whom you are grateful. I am grateful for the rock formations and the saguaro cacti that accompany me from Phoenix to Payson, Arizona to resilience. Now let your imagination take you to places where your spirit finds renewal and calm and be grateful. And women who are saying yes to who they are in this world. I invite you to think about those for whom you are grateful in the larger world.
Gratitude opens a way to be the change needed in this world. Let us pray together. Gracious presence, holy change, we gather up our gratitude, shifts our focus from our frustrations to the gifts around us. May your presence teach us the way of gratitude for the soft slant of sunlight, a song in the wilderness, the e a deep breath. Amazing grace, may your presence teach us the way of gratitude for the tended wound, a refreshing silence, a friend-filled call, the miracle and the holy mysteries hidden within our living. Change-making God, may your presence teach us the way of gratitude for tears when grief overtakes us, human dignity and courage in the midst of stars that illumine the darkness, and a glimpse of your kingdom where compassion and justice embrace. Thanks be to you that we can be the change. We join our voices in change. We join our voices in a prayer shared by the change maker from Nazareth, saying together, uh -huh. Parent, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to share with you some opportunities to love and serve, but before I do that, this last week has been full of people who have spent time and energy in grand celebrations. The family promised gala, and it uh, raised, okay, more than $100, right? Something like that. <laughs> more than $100,000, right? Something. $349,000. There one... And Lynn Dan had something to do with that. And, and um, there was a celebration of the coming of the Linton baby. There was a, a gathered group of volunteers that moved the Alvey family from one apartment to the other. These have all been opportunities that someone seized and took advantage of to celebrate this last week. They were at uh, the at the overnight for our Family Promise families. And uh, for the last two weeks we've been doing that. They finally clear out their stuff. And Bill Jarvis tells me that it would be okay if someone wanted to volunteer to be the bedding cleanup person at the end of each week, the person at the end of each week that we have that. That they, he loves gathering you and putting you, assigning you. But if there would, is that what you are talking about, Bill? Someone to attend to the cleanup of the rooms. He needs it today and he needs it on um, he needs it today and he needs it on um, three months from today. So is that right? <clears throat> okay. So maybe someone could help with that. <clears throat> okay. So maybe someone could help with that. There's fellowship hour afterwards. There's, a, I know, a meeting here in this room that uh, a, attends to the New Beginnings uh, refugee work. I'm going to let you go get some coffee or whatever and come back for that at about 11. To go get some coffee or whatever and come back for that at about 11.30. And then finally, Kel gave me some cards about... Uh, if each of us took three of these cards and distributed them in our neighborhoods, the pumpkin patch would family and pet friendly would be uh, advertised to your neighbors and it would allow us to 
reach out and show them what we're all about out there for the next two weeks. So it starts with the pumpkins arriving next Sunday after church. We're going to have a little caravan carry on. But in the meantime, you might let people know that that's coming. The Tai Chi class uh, is now planning to meet at 11 on Saturday. And that is a class that is open to those who would accept that discipline on a weekly basis. It's not just a drop-in. It, it, I know you can miss one or two. Uh, a discipline and a um, practice of peacefulness. And it is in our fireside room on a Saturday at 11 a.m. ongoing. And you'll see more about it. Eight weeks. On to say. On that note, let's open our blue hymnals uh, to 606 and stand as we're able and end our worship today with God whose giving knows no ending. And now go forth, go forth, achieve, connect, enjoy, for your faith has made you well. Amen.